never uh, felt awkward about my desires and i wondered why other people had a problem with my desires most of the if you talk to most of our ministers and most of our they're really terrified about sexual practices they're like for them sexual it's something like a predator and a prey and there is some kind of exploitation they don't understand fun india mein na sab property hadapte hain so really the court case is about how can we confiscate the property of gay men and women so when they die so that we don't give that property and i know such cases but chanakya said you cannot wake up a person who pretends to be asleep i think 99.9 cases of rape child abuse is done by straight people why do they deserve marriage and if you take care of their gay uncles and aunts and nieces take care of their gay uncles and aunts and in exchange they get the property which i think is fair or it's just love sometimes and friendships love is far more powerful than law and i think if you re- rely on law to create a civilized society then we are foolish people hello and welcome to the indian express um i my guest today is devdat patnayak um writer mythologist devdat patnayak he needs no introduction he is actually a regular columnist with uh, indian express he does wonderful videos with us for for the upsc section where he breaks down indian myths and culture but today here uh, today here with us is here with us uh, to discuss something completely different uh they that five years ago today um you know like the, the supreme court of india de- decriminalized uh section 377 of the ipc it struck it down uh do you remember what what are your memories from that day so i was in the supreme court on that day so i was supporting the people there and i was with the petitioners i was with the uh, lawyers and we fought i've got photographs from that time <laughs> um and uh, so it was a good memory you know it was a great memory of being there um it was really an anti climax because i expected it to be like a huge explosion will happen and all that but life just went on as normal you know but the fact is on that day we were no longer criminals and for me that was a very important day because it was my sister's birthday so it was like her, she giving me a gift and you know 10 years before that um if i'm not mistaken you had this the supreme court had uh, sort of turned down the delhi high court judgment and that was my birthday so i was heartbroken you know when i was like 11 december 11 december was my birthday that's my birthday too that's bizarre oh, it is. <laughs> so my friends everybody we were all like sort of in a expecting the so delhi high court judgment was so powerful that everybody thought that supreme court will accept it nobody doubted it and then this judge for some mysterious reason which we won't understand um and i guess he doesn't have owe anybody an explanation uh decided to criminalize it and for 10 years we had to wait till you know another case was filed and then the thing happened so i think that was my memory of that day it was a sense of relief you know it took a long long time uh, you know to see this uh change um and it was necessary i think it was overdue outdated primitive ideas still persisting so you know it was good thing that the supreme court took a long time to overturn uh, and you know decriminalize a very very outdated practice um dev that i was actually doing a bit of research and i i was reading an article from 2018 uh, uh it said that you um, in a television interview you you came out but then you had come out to your family and people around you uh came out in after the uh, section 377 judgment uh but you had come out to your family and your everyone around you way before that right if you could tell us a bit about that story yeah. of coming out see every media house thinks when it discovers something it is a discovery for the world mm-hmm. you know so <laughs> you can't say anything about it so every journalist thinks that oh i read it therefore i must be the first to read it <laughs> so that's something that happens you know so i was never in the closet uh, my friends my family everybody knew about it people who needed to know in those days you couldn't talk about it publicly because for the simple reason i don't want to go to jail with it's a criminal offense so mm-hmm. you don't advertise it uh, but everybody knew about my sexuality i'd written a book called pregnant king a long long ago a uh, man who was a woman before that uh, so i've always written on queer issues and i've always wondered why india had such primitive uh views uh, but i've always been comfortable with my sexuality i never had a problem with my sexuality in fact i, I you know i had a very strange case i never uh, felt awkward about my desires and i wondered why other people had a problem with my desires 
you know it is my so when, when i was in the closet is not because i was afraid of other people but it was more because i looked at other people as being not so smart you know i realized people aren't so intelligent and that's a big real and now of course in this whatsapp world we realize how stupid people can be but i think my survival instincts uh, told me that uh, people are not very intelligent they are not very smart and they are not very kind and therefore it's discretion is the better part of valor and therefore i decided not to be very very public about it but in my private space if somebody asked me hey dev that are you gay i wouldn't give them a if and but oh me i don't know i would say no i'm gay or if somebody asked me why are you not married i would say i'm not married because i'm gay and normally if you say it with a lot of confidence people accept it most people accept it i faced only i think one person who was a little uncomfortable with it but then i made fun of him saying that i think there's a problem with you because you there's no problem with me there's a problem with you because you seem to be interested in my private life and that means that there's something creepy about you and he didn't like it uh, and today of course he's a friend and he said there i remember you telling me that that uh, you looked at me in the eye and said i think you you're a creepy person because of a problem with my private life and uh, he said it hit me very hard and i wondered why i was bothered by your private life and i realized that how we are condition to think in a particular way and life is about changing and growing true um you know um going back to what you said about you know that day uh, uh, of uh, 2018 where you expected there to be an explosion but nothing happened um but i would like to ask you like you know before that often we forget how things were right you know like for a lot of uh, young queer people uh, things have been more or less the same in the last 6 7 years but a lot for people your your age my age you know we we, we probably can map things better when it comes to what yeah, I, yeah, yeah. yeah like so if you could tell us yeah, you know. i am 53 years old and i sort of came out when i was 20 so 1990 roughly is when i started meeting gay people making friends and had a gay community i didn't realize there were gay people in india you understand i grew up in a world where i'm only exposed to uh, heterosexual stories and i had don't believe there are gay people in the world the only queer people are the hijras with whom i do, they are a transgender i didn't identify i knew my desires and i read that you know it was there perhaps in foreign countries but i never knew you know we didn't have access to foreign films we didn't have access to there were some books but the books were also about straight um things they were never real exposure to the west was very limited because we lived in a license raj we didn't have access to it's only when i was in college that multiple channels came up we started seeing programs from international shows we did not have internet we did not have smartphones none of the things that we take for granted today that you have access to the world india was a very cocoon nothing you had no information about the outside world unless you traveled abroad and though people like me we came from you know middle class if i thought that maybe for education i would go abroad but otherwise i was not and there were of course these fashion magazine and which talked a little bit about international world and they there was uh, i think a magazine called society magazine in mumbai run by a very famous editor called suma varghis who later became a friend because she published many of my articles and uh, she uh, published articles on how there was a queer movement happening in south uh, san francisco it was called salga then there was something called tricone uh, nowadays you know there are people uh, you know sandeep roy was part of it now he writes columns today um, so th- there were these vague references to gay people who of indian origin abroad and i thought i have to travel there to meet them and then of course uh, in the 90s early 90s bombay dost as a magazine emerged which was started by ashok rao kavi and uh, a lot of people in bombay and that sort of opened up a new world order for people then in the late 90s there was something called gay bombay that started in mumbai which started safe spaces where people could meet have parties um, meet, and you know basically talk because otherwise it was these furtive sexual encounters that people had the idea that you could have a social life outside just a furtive sexual encounter was amplified by groups like uh, gay bombay which is now celebrating its 25th year 
So 25 years have passed and I, you know, I got some messages from people from Gabe Ombe saying that, you know, we should celebrate. September is the month when they celebrate. So it's 25 years ago, let's in the early, late 90s, Gabe Bombay starts. That's, uh, uh, which talks about, and it was done by people who are anonymous. It was done, done socially in Bombay saying that, you know, we should just meet people. Similar things were happening in Delhi, but they're very tiny groups. That time the internet had just started. There was something called Yahoo groups. So, this is a very different world. And even before this, before I came out, my friends would say the only way to meet people is to in cruising spaces, which were public spaces. You would go to a park and only through eye contact you would meet people in public spaces like parks or railway stations or bus stations. So it was a very strange, furtive world, say about 40 years ago. Then about 30 years ago, you slowly start these internet groups emerging, small groups happening. But really, a little access to the internet was always limited. It really explodes when the internet comes. And then you have really a big access to the world. And suddenly, you have stories, you're uh, watching, you know, there was this um, English soap opera called Dynasty where there was the main lead character was gay and that was like a huge thing. Oh my God. And then of course, unfortunately, I was in the medical college in the 1990s when HIV AIDS happened and we forgive, nobody remembers it. Unfortunately, the 90s were a time when the HIV AIDS in India, in 80s in America, but 90s in India. So you had this HIV AIDS and I think that's the first time the government of India was forced to acknowledge the fact that may, there's something called MSM, men who have sex with men, uh, from a health point of view. So the, really, it's a very unfortunate entry point was the HIV AIDS, which happened in the uh, 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 early uh, 90s, uh, uh, late 90s. And that's when HIV AIDS and, you know, Onir made this very famous film called My Brother Nick Hill, mm -hmm. which people saw. And it's, it's a classic, it's a masterpiece because it openly talks about, it sort of, it's as close as you come to a gay film. I mean, there were other uh, gay films and all that, but, th you know, they were always caricaturish. This was a real, you know, Sanjay Suri's acting in it, a good-looking man talking about HIV AIDS, so effectively talking about, it became a code word for uh, men who have sex with men. The idea of homosexuality was started being discussed in medical forums uh, but as a health issue as a physical health issue uh, money was coming into India so a lot of NGOs were starting for you know politicians want money so they I was surprised the government of Bom the Bombay's municipal corporation would talk about men and have sex with men the police were being educated about it so it was a that is when how the HIV AIDS and gay movement and then gradually the lesbian movement started and people started talking about pride all these things sort of slowly percolated into a consciousness which i think led to groups like nas to petition go to the court and say you know what let's just get rid of this law and that's how it all this journey started it was a very long journey um anjali of nas just took a very major role in this um, you know there was a show crowd there were lots of people uh, i don't remember all the names but these were people who really uh, stuck their neck out in those days and absolutely and we stand on their shoulders today and of course um, the uh, you know like uh, and the young generation today have a lot uh, to thank them for like uh, and um, so but moving ahead um, you know like uh, going back to the judgment um, the government uh, was ordered by uh, uh, the judges to uh, sensitize the public about uh, the LGBTQIA plus community uh, but little was done on uh, in that respect, right? There were, has, uh, but but we all agree. Can we agree that there has been a silent revolution in terms of popular culture since the, then, like uh, since the judgment? Uh, Not because of the government; it's despite the government. Despite the government, so yeah. government has done. It. Hmm. You know, even today we have films which sort of discuss sex education, primitive very basic level. Even today, people are embarrassed about talking about menstruation. So we are a very primitive level of thinking even in the most educated schools i've met educated people rich people famous people and we assume that they're educated they're not they, they're uh, even i've seen people who live in these very affluent suburbs of bombay don't know how to talk about uh, women's hygiene and you know the fact that menstrual hygiene what will they talk about sex and sexual pleasure and the idea that sex can be pleasurable they only talk look at the way we talk about sex in our country either it is through you'll get pregnant you'll be raped or you'll get a disease it's that's how you approach sex and therefore sexual is approached in this very dark and dirty way rather than, you know, the Kama Sutra, which talks about pleasure, Nanangaranga, which talks about pleasure and fun and relationships and bonding. 
we don't make it a fun thing. It's a great thing. But luckily, young people have survived because I think when I watch Instagram videos and see young boys and girls talking about sex, they are all kinds of people are there. They seem to be very casual about it. I'm shocked at how, I mean, I am sometimes <laughs> feeling like a conservative uncle because I see this 20 year old saying, yeah, yeah, I have a boyfriend, but I'll also have a girlfriend and I'm like oh my god which you know and the casualness with my nephews and nieces talk about boyfriends and girlfriends and I'm like this is not what happened when we were growing up these are children they just talk about BF and GF and this and um, they talk about sex so casually they talk about buying condoms very casually um, and, and I think there is I mean depending on which class so I think, uh, you know, the base. Yeah, they're very comfortable. Like, you know, they're like, you know, everybody's queer and then you can be straight. And that's what at least in yeah, certain then, pockets. Yeah. At least in certain classes, definitely. Yeah. You have these Netflix shows. Every show you watch, you know, there is this right now, this film called Red, White and Royal Blue. And yeah. who is watching them? Girls are watching them. So girls are enjoying boys making out. <laughs> You know, in the old days, you know, creepy straight men would watch lesbian porn on television. And uh, that was a creepy thing that we would see. And then you would see, uh, now you're seeing young girls enjoying boys in love. And I'm like, it started, it's a phenomenon that started in Japan and China, and now reached India and through Netflix and all this. And this is happening despite the government. I don't think the government is sort of helping. I don't think most of the, if you talk to most of our ministers and most of our, they're really terrified about sexual practices. They're like, for them, sexual, it's something like a predator and a prey and there is some kind of exploitation. They don't understand fun. So, you know, you don't expect politicians to understand fun anyway. But even doctors don't understand fun and pleasure and joy and bonding. Uh, so I think that's um, the, that's one fun thing that I see in the internet. I see a lot of young people having a more open view. Uh, even in small towns, in villages, I see these little videos. They make fun of it, but the word gay has gone in. The idea that men can be attracted to men, the idea that women can be attracted to women um, has reached every corner of India because of the internet. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can do nothing about it. The most conservative family, the boy and girl have access to phone. They have got knowledge about, depends on what they access, but they've got access to, um, you know, this idea of sexuality in this broader sense of the term. Uh, so uh, the marriage equality debate is on in, in the highest court of India, right? And both sides have presented their uh, arguments. Um, but as a gay man, as a queer person, what do you think every citizen of India, um, gay or straight, should consider before weighing in on the issue? What do you think are the... the marriage is only about property transfer. <laughs> actually at a very fundamental level it's about uh, documents about who gets your property and remember um, straight people don't want gay people to give their property to their lovers they want to hadap na india mein na sab property hadapte hain so really the court case is about how can we confiscate the property of gay men and women so when they die so that we don't give that property and i know such cases i know at least three cases like this when um, and it doesn't just happen with um, uh, you know we have got lawyers in our country very senior lawyers and who are half dead but getting married again in London you know this kind of <laughs> ancient people uh, you know they are allowed to have like several wives but they will argue against gay people having even one lover with whom they can share property share their lives share their life insurance share, share their documentation so it's a that's not equality so clearly it's against equality if one man is allowed to have multiple wives and not because of religion but the court is allowing legally a straight man to have multiple an old man marrying a young girl is considered okay just because he's rich and powerful having multiple wives is okay and you're not allowing a young man to share his life with another young person I mean that's just creepy and strange and I don't think you can rationalize it saying culture allows it because culture allowed you know culture doesn't allow divorce but in India divorce is very rampant today because the court allows divorce culture doesn't allow divorce Indian culture doesn't allow divorce um, so we must remember that and divorce is a so I uh, you know when it comes to legal matters I don't think people are very rational as I said in the beginning people are mean and just because they're educated and they have you know sitting in courts of law and talking you know if you have spiritual upliftment and you're spiritually evolved you'll be kind and you'll find a way out you will find a way out to help people 
live together, become uh, partners, you know, find a law, find a way of doing so that people can give the property to whoever they love, who they can have the same life insurance policy, HR benefits, uh, partners can have it. All those things can be done if the will is there. If the will is not there, you will find different ways. You know, there's this very famous line. Again, we, let's claim Chanakya said it. But Chanakya said, you cannot wake up a person who pretends to be asleep. Mm -hmm. And what I saw in the court is lots of people pretending to be asleep. They were not saying, hey, we have to solve this problem. How do we solve this problem? Because there is the magic, you know, there's a straight people, thousands of years of tradition. There's a marriage simple. How do we solve this problem? That was not the approach. It was a very confrontative, combative approach, not a conciliatory approach, which is a very um, terrible thing and indicates low spirituality for me. It doesn't require, it's not rational. It's just low spiritual levels. All this talk of Sanatan Dharma and all that, but absolutely low spiritual growth. Yeah, and uh, one of the arguments which I heard in the court, and uh, strangely enough, amongst a lot of queer people too, is the fact that they say pe people from the queer community cannot sustain relationships. Uh, therefore, they don't deserve uh, the institution of marriage. Um, what do you have to say about that? Like, you know, what do you feel? Well, across India, there's a lot of prostitution that happens. There are a lot of rapes that happen. Who visits prostitutes? Heterosexuals. Who visits uh, rape? I think 99.9 .9 cases of rape, child abuse is done by straight people. Why do they deserve marriage? This kind of is nonsense. These are, as I said, if you want to find excuses, you will find. The fact is 99% of rapists are heterosexuals. So should we say heterosexuals should be denied marriage and they should be sort of given shock treatment till they stop abusing women? And then they should be allowed to marry. So, you know, should they should go through a training program so they don't become uh, a potential rapist because every straight man is a potential rapist of women. You know, these kind of ridiculous arguments uh, are something that people come up with and they call it rational. They're not rational, it's low spiritual index. And it's, which is a nice way of saying stupid. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, the institution of marriage, apart from everything else, also, uh, as you said, is transactional, uh, and also it offers a lot of support to uh, the 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 people who partake in it, right? As uh, financially, and especially for aging people, it's like a great support system. But do you, but that obviously because if we are not uh, given uh, the right to marry for queer people, we don't have that support system. So how do you think it works out for aging queer men and women in India? Like when we don't have the support. See, most rich old people today are lonely and miserable because the children they thought will take care of them have gone away. Hmm. They've gone away abroad. They've gone away to different cities. Nobody wants to take care of their parents. So old parents with like nurses taking care of them. And that's the reality of your city. So this heterosexual model of children taking care of you will never happen. The fact is you will die lonely. One of the spouses will die and you will die. And many of our friends, straight friends, discover their parents three days after they are dead in some house. And these stories are going around everywhere. So it has nothing to do with straight. And growing old is common for all of us. We'll all grow old. We'll all be alone. We need people to take care of us. Hopefully family, but if not family, an extended family. If not an extended family, then support staff. And uh, support staff only if you're rich and elite and privileged, right? What about the poor? So you need an extended system. And you know, in ancient India, people... Uh, um, you know, uh, people forget something about India, ancient India, is that marriage as we define it today is a very British idea. Uh, remember, the British created these marriage laws. There were all kinds of crazy things happening in India before. Uh, well, crazy, no, but, you know, the different kinds of marriages. There were women, um, you know, there were courtesans who never got married, but they could uh, had property which they could transfer to their daughters. And they were individuals, you know, they, we call them courtesans, but they were basically independent women with property and agency. And um, they, didn't, they didn't need marriage. Marriage was only amongst the elite because you wanted land to pass from one who should own the land. Poor people, marriage, nobody bothered about marriage and poor people, landless laborers, peasants. We don't have marriage records of these people, say, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. This whole idea of marriage, registering marriage is a Christian concept. Nikah Nama is an Islamic concept. Registering marriage is not a Hindu concept. So, you know, communities came together and organized different forms of marriage. 
it's polygamy there was polygamy you know there are many parts of india where only one son was allowed to marry the rest of the family would not marry uh, in goa there were these rules where the, one of the sons had to become a christian so that he could control the property the other brothers would not become christians in punjab you have some children practicing sikh practices some being hindu so it's very complicated in our country um, you know and um, we are trying to assume that these marriage laws were very clean and they were never like that they were very very complicated and the british tried to streamline it using colonial ideas and these happened in the last 200 years so uh, if you're talking about uh, you know this law protecting us no i don't think so we have to figure out our own systems um, and if people are young people sometimes are foolish and they feel that you know youth will last forever but it stops after the age of 30 so we have to figure out our own relationships we have to um, you know have informal relationships formal relationships friends lovers uh, sometimes friends living together old people living together just friends and i think friendship network is far more powerful than a relationship network uh, or a family network bloodlines may not be there you may or may not have lovers uh, you don't need to have that you ultimately you need friends who take care of each other hopefully intergenerational younger people taking care of the older people uh, you know and this kind of uh, new family structures will emerge in this world right as children you have single parent families those children are going abroad and studying out coming back to church. so uh, you have a lot of lonely people straight gay doesn't matter the fact is in the next 10 20 years we'll see a lot of old people some with lots of money being taken care of by staff and younger people and you know uh, i know a lot of rich gay men who have sort of semi adopted these young men then the young men take care of them and when they die that flat or their house or whatever they have goes to the son, goes to their this, this gay person and so people come up with these arrangements you know nephews take care of their gay uncles and aunts and nieces take care of their gay uncles and aunts and in exchange they get the property which i think is fair or it's just love sometimes and friendships so i think we have to cultivate these relationships it doesn't happen because of, a court has told you to do it. it see law exists where there is no love love is far more powerful than law and i think if you re rely on law to create a civilized society then we are foolish people so we have to focus on nurturing loving friendships relationships uh, and i think that training nobody gives us in schools and colleges we have to learn these these are life skills we need the, the, the lovely thoughts Uh, so i think uh, on that note i think we can uh, you know like end this beautiful conversation and um, i would like to congratulate you on this very uh, important date for all of us uh, not just people from the queer community but uh, for india as a community as a nation i also look forward to the uh, you know uh, marriage equality judgment and hope to uh, catch you in a conversation after that thanks a lot for sure. joining us david thank, thank you thank you so much thanks